Am I connected? Yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends and family, fellow travelers, honored guests, uh, how wonderful that you're all here to hear us talk about the subject that has certainly focused Alvaro, uh, Kel Corbett, my colleague, who was also essential for the team, and me, about our work that took place over, I think, something like six months. And the result is the show which is uh, displayed throughout the whole of this wonderful 18th century building. I'm going to do two things. One, introduce the speakers, an incredibly distinguished uh, group, and then talk a little bit about the genesis of the show so we can get on uh, with the meat and potatoes of the evening, if I can put it like that, uh, <laughs> thereafter. So beginning with Alvaro, who was born in Caracas, Venezuela, to Grenadian and Haitian parents. He lives and works in New York, although he's temporarily relocated his studio to London until October, but I also heard November mentioned, so who knows, it might be a little longer. And that's why we've got his incredible library of books installed on the first floor, which is a way just to return or to focus on the show briefly, which is why um, we have his library here. So all the artists that are not represented in the exhibition for a variety of different reasons, uh, can be with us in books. And it means that anybody who comes here can spend their time either looking at, at books by artists they don't know or reminding themselves about great works by artists they do know. Alvaro spent his first eight years of his childhood living with his grandmother in Granada, and he draws on his formative experiences in his work, both in terms of the burlap he uses um, in place of canvas and also the wool that he uses in place of paint, as well as paint, I should say. And um, the, with a very strong reference to his Grenadian aunts and their sewing. He has a BFA from Hunter College, New York, then an MA from the Slade School of Fine Art in London. His first solo museum show was at, at MoMA PS1 in Long Island City in 2017. And he was uh, shown at this gallery last year in an exhibition called A Taste of Chocolate, curated by Norman Rosenthal, who is in my eyeline now. And so thank you, Norman, very much indeed for introducing not Alvaro, not only to us, but in a wider sense to, to uh, UK audiences. He has an upcoming show at Sadie Coles and Emmeline next year, and next year at Ropac in Paris. This year. This year in Ropac in Paris. And Ropac next year. Okay, let me reframe. So, <laughs> uh, Sadie and Emmeline is this year, uh, Ropac is next year in Paris. Issy Wood is an artist who is, whose work's actually directly again in my eyeline, um, which is very appropriate, was born in North Carolina and lives and works in London. She uses mediated images as source material for her work, including photographs taken from her phone, cuttings, and pictures of the late comedian Joan Rivers, who's become a recurring motif. The legacy of surrealism is evident in much of her work, and she completed her MA at the Royal Academy Schools in London in 2018. She's had group shows as Carlos Ishigawa in 2017, Virginia Woolf, an exhibition inspired by her writings at Tate's St. Ives in 2018, and the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw in 2019. Her first museum show at Goldsmiths CCA is being installed almost as we speak. I think it opens on Saturday. Saturday night. Fantastic. Um, the discussion is moderated by Jennifer Higgy, who I'm sure you all know. And thank you so much, not only for being here, but also to Freeze for your partnership for this, this talk this evening. Um, Jennifer is an Australian writer based in London. She's editorial director of Freeze magazine and the editor of Freeze Masters magazine. She has written over 200 features, published a novel, Bedlam, a Sternberg Press, and is the editor of the artist joke, Whitechapel MIT Press. She has also written a very good children's book, which I can testify uh, holds young children <laughs> completely fascinated for hours. She was a member of the Turner Prize jury in 2008 and has had a screenplay made into a feature film. So about the show, which is an incredible 49 artists, uh, artists that some of you may know incredibly well and others that you may not be familiar with, which is really the point. Um, it's 
genesis was as a result of a studio visit, the result of many studio visits I went made to Alvaro studio and conversations that we were having about art. And then I said something sort of vague, like, well, it would be wonderful to do a project together. And he said, well, I've had this art, this art that I've been wanting to do for some time, which is, of course, the exhibition that see now. The title is important because it's unbelievably clear. There is absolutely no confusion about what it is, artists I steal from. And I think one of the interesting things about this title is that we all steal. Uh, artists certainly steal from each other. And what this show intends to do is make clear why Alvaro, who in this particular case, I always think of as the sort of artist everyman. In other words, if you take as a premise that all artists steal, artists is being, um, Alvaro is being incredibly generous to lay bare for all of us his thinking about why he does it, what fascinates him, what excites him, what intrigues him, sometimes what he likes, sometimes what he doesn't like. And by doing that, it enables me to look at the art that we see around us in a different way. I think one of the things that is one of the great pleasures of life is to look well and to look at art well. And I think I find it's one of the more difficult things to do and consistently do at a very high level and not get into what I call sloppy looking, where you kind of go, oh yeah, I know that, blah, 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 and then run on. And this, is, this show is about saying, hang on a second, you know, it's not an artist I know. The catalogue, when it comes out, and I think you can all uh, see a printout at the desk, you'll see why Alvaro chose the artist in this show. He went through an incredibly rigorous process, very often seven o'clock calls when he was still in bed, like, wakey, wakey, we're now going to have another look at um, you know, the writing for today. And his generosity, as I've said in that respect, was remarkable. And also, of course, it's an incredibly engaging project to work on because uh, Gilbert and George say to be with art is all we ask. And I think to write about and to talk about art is all we ask. Now, what have I forgotten? Um, yes, the show is divided into five sections to try and make an order to what, what we see. And they were absolutely sections that Alvaro... Um, constructed from the beginning. And the reason why this, there is so much of his writing on the wall, as you will have seen, the labels are his writing, they're not mine or anybody else's. There are his notes that you might find in his studio. And in fact, the exhibition in the Ely Room was very much composed of notes, postcards, um, elements of diary, images from magazines. And what sort of amuses me is that for the period of the summer, uh, Gallery Today's Ropec has been turned into an artist-run space, and I find that a really wonderful idea and a, a testament to Today's generosity that he would, he would not only support a project like this, but also give the gallery over um, to artists as widely uh, spaced as those in this show, some who are living, but many who are not. Um, so, there is one work by Alvaro, and only one in the exhibition, because this is not about looking at Alvaro's work and going, ah, I see that little bit on the top right-hand corner, and that's how it relates to whatever I'm looking at. That's really not the interest. And the interest, I think, is, more, is far broader and more nuanced than that. And in the catalog, Will, um, but I hope I'm going to be able to have it. I still don't have it yet. Oh, yes, I do. I'm going to read you one quote. Let's see if I can find it. Um, to give you an idea of what this might mean. Hold on a second. Here we have Cy Twombly, nearly. It's, an, it's a drawing in the first room that you come in on the left-hand side, and it's never been seen before. And so these sort of things, as the co-curator, of course, is incredibly exciting. So let me give you an idea of what you can look forward to in the catalogue. Drawing with pencil is the most direct expressive form. 
and for many is connected to our larger culture because we first learn to write using a pencil. Cy Twombly does many things with pencil, but I'm most inspired by the space he provides for action. Most of the surface serves as a space for the act of drawing, movements he easily shifts into when painting. In a way, he equates the paintbrush and the pencil, eliminating that false hierarchy between mediums. He also always knows the exact distance to lead between one set of marks and another, which requires incredible restraint. If his canvas or paper were a movie, he would have known exactly when silence should lead to a big bang. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> um, thank you, Julia. That was a great introduction. Can you hear me? Let me know if the uh, mic isn't working. I feel like we all feel like Madonna up here because we've got these little funny <laughs> microphones. Um, uh, it's an absolutely fascinating show, okay. and I'm really looking forward to this discussion, actually, because there's a lot of questions that I have personally around it, as well as I think might contribute to a, a good general conversation. And, um, you know, one of the fascinating things in this show is that it's very much a, it's like walking into a crowd of people having a lot of very different conversations, and all of them are interesting. And some are following one route down here, and others are talking about something else that's really particular. And so, um, in a way, one of the, maybe the, the first things that I thought about looking at this show was what's the difference between an artist curating a show and a curator, a more traditional or conventional curator? Not that curators are conventional, but um, doing a show. What, what do you think an artist putting a show like this together with the help of Julia, what, what does that mean? What does that bring to it? Um. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, I'm sort of a virgin to sitting in front of this, this many group of people. So hopefully <laughs> you could be easy with me today. <laughs> but um, I think the sort of nexus to the show was, um, or sort of the impetus to like why I wanted to be an artist and when I decided to become an artist was, um, I really wanted to know what was what was uh, in front of me. Like, why was I grew up in New York? So you go in front, you go to MoMA, and people would be like, "Oh, I, I could do the Jackson Pollock." And so I thought, um, in, in choosing to become an artist, I wanted to let go of my ego. I wanted to not be that that person who said I could do this thing. And because um, I remember growing up in the '90s my stepdad would be like, I could be a rapper, a hip hop, hip hop. And then he just sort of like <laughs> would make fun of rappers. And so I just thought, you know, uh, artists, are, artists are sort of, uh, there's a, a great Erica Badu quote, I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my shit. And so I thought all of these people are sensitive about what's in front of them. And the least I could do is sort of be respectful and sort of ask myself, what is these artists doing? and not necessarily assume that I, I, I could do it. And um, so I started sort of uh, being in front of artwork and sort of writing down what was in front of me, what I saw, and, and eventually it sort of became, it, I sort of realized that, oh, that painters um, are working within a language that it's sort of like, you know, it's like learning German or learning Mandarin, and so I wanted to sort of take the time to learn what that language was. And so, to your to your question in terms of what it meant to look at this as a sort of as a as a maker um, versus a curator, I think curators are sort of looking at uh, different aspects of how culture and how artists exist. And I think I was just sort of looking at these artworks as individuals who are um, thinking about something external that's happening to them and trying to figure out how to transform that experience into something pictorial, mm -hmm. something that has a sort of internal logic. And so, uh, and that is working within the long history of looking and making and history that sort of goes back thousands of years to cave paintings and, you know, people putting pigment on, a, mm. on some sort of surface. Mm. I mean, Julia, what would you see as the difference between an artist curating and a curator curating? Well, I, 
Um, firstly, there's, there's no, there needs to be no structure. So an academic will say, will think or could think, may think about things as a linear progression. And an an artist doesn't have to do that. That's not, it's about making connections. And I mean, I think that's one of the most exciting thing when you look at a work of art and you connect with it. And if you don't, then working to connect with it. So, and in a way, it's a more playful activity. It's as serious, of course, but it's more playful. It was incredibly good fun working with Alvaro. And some days. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's I think it's that. There's no there's no right or wrong way. Mm. And if it if it sort of goes steers too far off, then it's the job of the, I suppose, more I don't know, um, the institutional person to bring it round again. Mm. But it's giving the artist a platform, and that's really, really important. Mm. And 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 working to kind of interpret if and when it's necessary. Mm. Not interpret the work, but interpret how it can be made manifest. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, I think the use of the word um, steel is interesting in this context because, of course, steel has negative connotations of being illegal or being wrong, but I don't think anyone here would complain about any of the artists in this show borrowing or being influenced or or influencing each other. So um, w what do you think is the difference between good and bad stealing? It's like good and bad lies, I guess. I throw this out to you, who would like to answer it? <laughs> Izzy, maybe Izzy. you. Sorry, I, I mean, do you, um, can, do you think of yourself as a thief? <laughs> I suppose, I mean, I, I certainly feel the guilt of a thief a lot of the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it, I think you would be hard pressed to find an artist who hasn't at one point said, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna have that part of something that I like." Mm. And I think, and when we spoke on the phone a little bit about this kind of mastication process of, mm. you know, that while the raw material might be the same, the the digestion of it will, I think, produce something slightly different. I'm trying not to get into a kind of copra mm. <laughs> copra filling mm. like, uh, way of describing it, but um. I don't know, I think of like of these phrases, like this kind of old literature phrase of stealing a kiss mm -hmm. and that being, I mean, maybe that's not as appropriate in a post Me Too age, but I, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. it's a, uh, that, that it, to me, I think, I don't know, art seems the only realm where stealing can be an act of love mm -hmm. in a way. You know, mm -hmm. we talked about in, imitation as being the sincerest form of flattery and, um, and historically, there have been really sort of formalized ways where, you know, younger apprentices are asked to steal from a master. Um, and then mm. they they then go on and do their thing. And yeah. so I think as long as as long as it's it's taken and looked at well mm. um, and in some form given back generously, as I mm. think Alvaro has done here, um, then I would almost say there's no such thing as bad stealing. Bad and stealing, yeah. I think to steal to steal something that to, see it, to steal someone's perspective that, you know, either, either, you know, racially or culturally vehemently isn't yours. I think that's another question. Um, but yeah, hmm. I th I'm definitely a thief. I think it's hard yeah. to be a painter with that yeah. much history and not, and not yeah. in some way be thieving yeah. a little. I mean, as you say, that you know, the history of painting is a history of people setting up their easels in galleries and museums, and you know, copying what's in front of them in order to learn how a painting is constructed, so that they can then use these skills in order to reinterpret them. So, I guess what it comes down to is the idea of um, imitation. If you're just purely imitating something without bringing bringing a new spirit into it, yeah. then that's mm. a sort of uh, a sort of empty kind of theft isn't it but it's I mean, copying in yeah, a way as, yeah. I mean, as you said and copying has a great value but stealing stealing is a recognition in the brilliance of the other person that mm. can be recalibrated mm. to to be equally value for oneself and then that mm. makes it incredibly exciting and it's a kind of extraordinary springboard too mm. it's like okay so that's how they did it maybe if I start there and then who knows? Mm. When I think about music, I mean, we've you know we've spoken about hip hop and rappers, but I think a lot of kind of music where where a sample will be used, yeah. you know, where mm. 
Kanye or someone will take will take something from the 20th century and um, and take just the bit that he wants and then you know use it to explain how not a lot has changed in the world from you know from that point of view to now to now this point of view and I think I'm always a fan of that of just saying you know look at this 200 years ago I don't think much has changed the way that man is looking at that woman in that painting is not is not entirely different to the way the way I've seen a man look at a woman in Piccadilly Circus drunk you know yeah. and I think yeah I think that's where that's where you know flagging up something um, and you know sampling quote unquote can be mm. can be really fruitful mm. yeah well I don't think I think this is I don't think the human condition changes I think we're all subjective people and I think we're all always going to essentially go through the same sort of subjective feelings whether it's love or anxiety or fear I think uh, part of that is why a really good artwork can be important a thousand years later. Mm. You know, um, being in London, I'm, you know, you're sort of aware of like Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet. And I think, you know, we're all aware of like what it means to be 15 or 16 and just so sort of like blindly over, over emotionally thinking every moment, every period is like the, the end all be all. And I think as long as that sort of anxiety of first love exists and Shakespeare will always be important. Mm -hmm. But in terms of your question, and in, 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 I think in, in, in terms of stealing, and Izzy and I spoke about this, you know, our, I think our, our, our life is sort of centered around making paintings mm -hmm. and, and for, individuals who maybe, you know, do it as a hobby, then I think it's okay if you look at um, a Howard Hodgkin or whoever and say, I'm going to go and make this for my daughter or for my mm -hmm. kids, whereas I don't think we necessarily have that excuse. I don't think something, <laughs> not, anymore. <laughs> not anymore, you know, we sort of are, our sort of intellectual and emotional and almost entire being goes towards what can we do when faced with this sort of uh, blank canvas in front of us and, mm -hmm. what can, and what can we experience and how can we tell something that is truly unique to our being mm -hmm. and hopefully maybe it transcends a generation or a couple generations. Mm -hmm. But um, I think in terms of stealing, we don't necessarily, I'm not interested in making, um, a jazz song from 1920 because I'm not a jazz music. I'm not living in 1920, you know, I'm living in 2019. And uh, there's so many things happening around me that I think is relevant. And I think it's my job to acknowledge what's relevant and what's happening and, and the community that I grew up in and, and, and my brothers and my friends and the people who are here. I think it's really important to recognize how they affect my being and then go to the studio and try to make make that sort of feel real to them. Um, and I don't I don't get to do that by making a sort of uh, bad Matisse from 1930. Because I, I don't know how many of you guys know Matisse personally or had tea with him, you know. <laughs> but we're having a conversation now. So I think, you know, this is more real to me. I mean, as much as Matisse mm. is real to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess um, this brings in ideas around um, repetition is only useful when it's about a kind of renewal, when mm. it's taking a form and then enriching it with something unique from this particular moment in time. I always remember this um, great, uh, in the book that Kierkegaard wrote about repetition called On Repetition, and he starts it by talking about going on this journey to a, a town, in a, and he was in a coach being pulled by horses, and the, and the coach on rang out at one point, and he got to where he was going, and he had a great time. And then he got home again, and he said, I want to do exactly the same journey again. Uh -huh. And so he set out to do exactly the same journey, and he noticed that when the coach on was rung the second time he was doing it, it reverberated differently in terms of yeah. sound, uh -huh. you know, even though yeah. he was do only doing it a few weeks later. Yeah. And that's exactly... I think, you know, w with an exhibition like this and seeing all of these great artists in this show, you see the reverberations are echoing differently each time, even though they might be using a similar trope, like 
a, a portrait or a self-portrait or a landscape or they're, they're reverberating differently, I think. But I think it's, I mean, one of the things that we haven't talked in any great detail about the um, sections, mm. but one of the things that I think is incredibly fascinating about the section about the South, and this is, this is basically two walls, one on the end wall behind everybody who's sitting here and this one here behind us, and Alvaro's point about Rauschenberg, who lived five kilometers away from Thornton Dahl, for mm. example. So they were breathing the same air, mm. they were looking at the same landscape, they're probably going to the same coffee shop. Mm. And I'm one of the things about stealing is, you know, it's what triggers what triggers a kind of a change, a, a thought process that can be unbelievably productive and achieve something totally unexpected. It's mm. such an abstract kind of idea. And one of the things that fascinates me is that is that how many um, shows, exhibitions Alvaro goes to see. I wish I could go. I did go to a small percentage of that. Mm. Because by looking, it's it's about triggering that kind of mental process mm. that then leads something, it leads somewhere else. But that to me is absolutely stealing. It's like I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna mm. take that. And it's kind of and then making a new cake with all mm. with all of it. Amazing. Mm. I mean, to 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 be a thief in a, in this sense, you, it's a very conscious decision as well. And so, I'm curious about when you first realised that you were allowed to thieve. Like, at what point in your practice as an artist did you go? Actually, I don't have to be entirely original in the sense that I have to make something that has no bearing on anything else. I can make something that is infused with everything that has made me a human being in terms of what I've looked at, how I've lived, and where I'm going. Some, that's a good sound for that. <laughs> <laughs> Forward and back. Sound of thought. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think I'd, my my various thefts, I think, have only... I've realised, and we've spoken about this, about this before, of I've, I've realised having made a painting in the studio and then seen something in it that then was common to say a museum leaflet I picked up, you know, from, from Naples four years ago and to see some direct correlation in hindsight um, between a painting, you know, a, an mm. abandoned Bruegel in the Capo di Monte or whatever and then, and then a, um, a similar trope, either a similar brushwork or, a, or a, um, an actual man's face almost. Mm. And I sort of have to, I, I noticed that and I sort of have to let myself off the hook retroactively, almost. To say and was this that, you know, the first time you remember having this experience? It was, yeah, it's hard, I don't know, it's hard to say. I suppose I started with collage, so I was always, I was used to a very mm. literal version of mm. getting things that already exist yeah. and chopping them up. And, I, yeah. and I, I, I'm I, sure that aspects of painting now for me include that, maybe in a, mm. maybe in a more mental, mm. a mental way. Mm. But it was, yeah, it started with me as a, as a very literal kind of, you know what Photoshop was before I learned Photoshop yeah. was um, was getting something and hacking at it yeah. and then combining it in a way that I mm. that I felt best represented what whatever teenage angst I was feeling at mm. the time mm. um, and being okay with that mm. I think yeah a quest for originality kind of died a death for me on my BA <laughs> um, and that can be very liberating very yeah, yeah. I mean like any yeah. like any death there's a mourning process but I you know to mm. To say no, I can, I can still, I can still take, and there'll be some aspect of originality, you know, even mm. if I'm not striving for it. Then, I, th I think I could still make things that only I can make, if mm. that makes sense. Yeah, you know, I everything mean, from reverberations to. With your painting up here, um, do you mind talking about the influences that help form this image? Yeah, I can. I mean, it's. Or do you prefer to keep them? No, it's a, it's a perfect one. So I was looking at yeah. it earlier, and I, I was thinking this. This woman's face that's kind of appearing under the mm. stairwell is one I've used hundreds of times in around 2018. And mm -hmm. it's it's a woman, a portrait of an unnamed woman from Roger van der Weyden, who was this 15th century yeah. Netherlandish mm. painter who was sort of this Jan van Eyck um, master. Mm. Um, and so, and she, her facial expression, though it was 500 years ago, really sums up my. Mm. <laughs> my mood when I'm making yeah. paintings or when I'm feeling a certain way about yeah. something. And so I, yeah, to outsource to her face or to, to bring her face mm. back in, um, mm. she's got this perfect mixture of indifference and, um, and then trying to stay very still. Mm. 
and I yeah so I so I took her as a kind of I mean like the Joan Rivers thing I'll I'll outsource a self portrait mm. or a portrait of someone I know to um to something else maybe out of cowardice of not wanting to address it directly right and has the title the naughty step got anything to do with this grand theft but I mean perhaps now that you say it again I realize <laughs> these things retroactively the titles yeah. happen and then the painting right. happens and um but yes yeah, so I was I was probably thinking about some kind of child Mm. Childlike. I think the steps are from a doll's house, so right. maybe that that makes sense. Right. I mean, this is why I write really is because so I can sort through this mm. stuff afterwards. Mm. There's a painting for me doesn't. I don't know about you, Alvaro, but the painting doesn't involve a lot of intellectual things as I'm going along. I'll um. It's more yeah. The intellectual stuff comes afterwards, mm. or when someone flags it up, like mm. you just have. Yeah. I mean, Alvaro, how conscious is this dealing with, say, the work that you've made in the entrance? What was the evolution of that picture? Well, well, I think I think the culture I grew up in, which is sort of like early 90s, 80s, 2000 hip hop, was always about like sort of uh, taking things from taking old music or taking older music, whether it's Aretha Franklin, and then sort of juxtaposition it to your own voice. Mm -hmm. And then the conversation that sort of comes within like, you know, putting in a Luther Vandross and then cutting it up and then putting someone thing in, something else in. But then what does that say? So I remember like in the early 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, Eminem became like a really big thing, but also he was um, sort of getting a lot of flack for his homophobic comments. And so what they decided to do during a really important like, uh, like an MTV award was sort of use Elton John's um, uh, music with Eminem. And so it became this moment of like, um, by positioning Elton John who was openly gay with, uh, with Eminem, it sort mm -hmm. of became a different conversation about mm -hmm. what was possible. Mm -hmm. And so I was always very conscious of like, um, just growing up in that culture that my looking and thinking about something meant that I could put it in conversation and it, it could become something else. Mm. So, um, but, and then to Izzy's point, I mean, most of my paintings often start from a pretty like stupid observation or like something I don't think people, I think, oh, I wonder if I could get away with doing this. Mm. Like what, what kind of thing? Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is a little past PG-13, but the thing that I'm thinking <laughs> about is like uh, um, one of my partners a long time ago was white. I was getting out the bed and she looked at me and she said, oh man, you have a beautiful penis. And I thought, that's interesting. <laughs> and so then I made a painting about it. <laughs> but it was really like... Is that a humble brag? Uh, is that a humble brag? Yeah. No, it's not. I just didn't even think I mean, about it. I just thought it was like, yeah. that's such an interesting comment. Yeah. That I hadn't really thought, you know, and I just said, let me do this, you know, why yeah. not, you know? Yeah. But it's a good insight because I think, you know, if we weren't artists, we, I guess you would just take that compliment and be flattered by it and maybe yeah. tell some friends. But the idea that you then take it to the studio <laughs> is... I know it's an extra step. Yeah, as you go, <laughs> thinking about it. Might man. be a step too far, but I, I don't know, it's not for me to say. Yeah. And you can always be reminded of the, of the comment every time you see the painting too. So oh, it's yeah. just, you know, Yeah, it forever. belongs in a friend's house and it's That's like nice. right on the side. So. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> yeah. oh, God, I'm, I'm distracted now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, back to the show. Um, in terms of um, this show and the work that you've sort of brought together as this sort of um, this rich, rich conversation, I, I, I keep being sort of reminded that in a sense the thieving or the homage isn't just about, you know, a surface appearance. It can also be about a mood or it can be about a sound or it can be about a moment in time when you've seen this picture and what that means to you at that point in time. So I think the whole idea of theft as well is, is such a diffuse one. It would be very hard for the police to catch you, mm. you know, because it's so, a mood. to pin you down, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, to yeah. really 
yeah. get but you it, on this it's one. It's also about, you know, about an approach, an mm. attitude. It's not only about the thieving of an image. Yeah. It, and that's what's so incredibly interesting about it. It's, it's mm. you know, to be, to make, to be an artist, I think is, is the most difficult thing in the world because yeah. it has to be sustained over decades. So seeing, firstly, seeing how other people do it, but also mm. to see how they don't do it, you know, mm. um, quick looking, quick making, slow. I mean, all those things, it's incredibly nuanced. Mm. And I think that's what makes it so fascinating. Mm. I feel, you know, having had conversations, many, many conversations with Kelsey Corbett um, about each and every work in this show, you know, I, I've learned a lot from doing that. It's, but looking is the key to everything, really. Yeah. And um, artists look better than anybody. Yeah. I should, I mean, it's, personally, it's, it's nice for me because I was Alison Katz, who's in the hallway with the cockerels. That I was her studio assistant for two oh, years. Oh, really? Oh, great. And... I was on my BA, and I totally stole from her. I mean, I stole, yeah, I stole, I stole a, a way of conducting oneself as a female artist, but I also stole motifs to the point that she had to sit me down and say, Izzy, you have to earn your motifs. And that was always, <laughs> that always stuck with me, and that's maybe the best thing I learned from. But I, you know, as a student, I was used to looking at things and wanting to, and wanting to mimic or to see what it would be like to be a proper a proper artist, and she was this first proper artist who was yes. really just doing that. Yes. Um, and it was a very yeah, almost a almost a emotionally too close relationship at times. But it well, was, I mean, that I mean, I don't know if you knew that when you put us together in the show, but it was, you know, we knew you knew we knew each other. Yeah. But it, to me, that's the really direct lineage of this. You know. Well, there are some artists that I know who changed their. Their, their studio assistants every few years <laughs> for exactly to, to stop that sort of closeness. In the yeah. and, um, you know, I, I was quite surprised when I first heard that, but I also understand it, mm -hmm. you know, because then the whole thing of authorship. I mean, stealing in the way that we're describing here, it never questions authorship because mm -hmm. that would be copying in a way that's not interesting. Mm -hmm because the weight of history for any artist, I would have thought, is more or less unbearable at times. And so it's really like what can jettison what you are into a new, into a new trajectory that really is interesting. Mm. I, I think that's a sort of good segue, though, into... The, into um, maybe we could talk about the ethics of, of stealing oh. and in terms of, say, cultural appropriation mm. or... For example, I remember um, a few years ago I was doing studio visits at an art school and I went in, there was this really um, impressive installation that this artist had done that was obviously um, influenced by um, Russian suprematism. And it looked, it looked really fantastic. It was really powerful. Everyone's saying, oh, it's amazing. And I said, oh, so, and it was really directly quoting from Russian suprematism. And I said, oh, so what's your interest in Russian suprematism? And she said, oh, I don't care about Russian suprematism. I just think it looks really cool. Oh. And, and I felt really irritated by this because I thought, you know, this Russian suprematism came out of a very particular moment, a very particular moment about, you know, a very oppressed people looking for a new form of representing a, a new world. And, you know, it was a powerful symbolic moment in history. And, you know, the art of the time embodied that and this girl was just saying it looks cool mm. and it really bugged me and mm. so we actually had quite a long and productive conversation about this um she stuck to her guns and yeah, yeah. and I, I felt still felt irritated but it was a, it was a good it was a good conversation it's quite an advertising mindset though, yeah you know, it was take, quite an advertising to take, to exactly. take the cool bits yeah. of something horrendous yeah and to run with those yeah to sloganize them. yeah and um you know obviously we're at a moment in time which i think absolutely rightly so we're questioning issues around cultural appropriation. I mean, would it have been okay if Picasso was painting now to be able to say, quote, African masks, at, totally out of context and without any sort of idea of the authorship of, you know, what were the cultures that produced these, these images, you know? So I'd, I'd like to hear from you guys, like what do you think is right to borrow and what would be off limits to borrow for you? you wanna go? Um, well, I, I think cultural appropriation is always about power. I think one of the, one of the, we're, we're in a great moment because I think um, more voices are being present, but the problem 
with like someone like Picasso wasn't necessarily that he saw a mask and decided to um, think through it pictorially and then invented something new. I think it was the sort of um, conversations that erased uh, those people's voices and how they were influential or how they, those art existed within their culture. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so like, even when you walk in the exhibition, the first painting on the left is this sort of um, the Kooning line drawing. Mm -hmm. And I was just in Paris at uh, this, this exhibition that Denise McMillan did, super brilliant. And she talked about how Matisse had left uh, France three times, went to Harlem mm -hmm. to listen to jazz. Mm -hmm. And so, and then it would invite these musicians back to Paris. And that's when Paris was sort of this cultural hub of jazz and all of these sort of influx of different cultures. Like Picasso wasn't from Paris. Van Gogh wasn't from Paris. Mm -hmm. It was really a sort of cultural hub where all these inventive, creative people met and had conversations. And so Matisse invited these folks back and then that's when you get his sort of very lyrical, jazzy sort of thing because he's actually having dinner and drawing these people. Mm -hmm. But what ends up getting, I think what ends up getting lost is that if you tell that story without the folks who are inventing jazz and being in the mm -hmm. conversation with it, then it leads way for a sort of cultural appropriation because you've erased some of these voice and you've sort of put this one man, this white man, as a sort of inventive genius. Mm -hmm. And that's not really, that, that's never really how history happens. You know, Pollock is with Lee Krasner, but he's also, you know, so it's, I think if, you know, in terms of thinking about cultural appropriation, but in terms of thinking about what artists can, can um, at least my responsibility is like, I think everything is open for me to look at and process and think about and anything that I feel and experience is real to me, but it's also making sure that while I have a microphone, that I'm not um, erasing or creating a space that erases someone's identity who sort of worked mm -hmm. to create this other thing that's really amazing. And I think that's mm -hmm. where sort of if you have this sort of uh, history of like cultural appropriation, mm -hmm. because it's been, people have not, people who've created those cultures, A, haven't profited from it, B, has had, their histories completely misrepresented um, or even, and, and sometimes just completely erased. Mm. It's hi hijacking almost when you sort of take the wheel of someone else's, yeah. someone, some, what someone else has worked for yeah. or someone else's suffering. I think that's what, you know, mm. about this Russian supremacy to be able mm. to. But it's but, interesting yeah. that the student felt able quite comfortably to say that. Yeah. That it, I mean, for, for somebody in my generation, that's the most shocking thing I've heard for a long time. But that it that in a way, the playfulness of it, it's like, oh, whatever, yeah. you know. But I, I also, we represent here um, Sturdivant, who's an artist mm -hmm. who I curated a show of her work here at Ropac, but also at the Serpentine. And of course, she she creates a different kind of context completely about stealing. It's not appropriation. Um, it's a kind of absorption, such a, a sort of entire absorption mm. of other artists' work. It then becomes something complete. It looks the same, but it's also something completely different. Mm. And I think she's the most extreme model that you could possibly mm. possibly cite of mm. an artist who, who does something very radical with other mm. artists' work. And, and what do you think her sort of imitation, in a sense, adds to the original work? Like when she... She becomes Joseph Boyce. What does yeah. she add to the debate around Boyce? Or, or what does she bring to Boyce's work, do you think, by becoming Boyce? Is it a gendered thing, do you think? Because I think it's partly a gender thing, mm -hmm. yes. And I think it's also that idea that you look anew when you look through the eyes of somebody else. Mm -hmm. I think that it's a very subtle thing. But, you know, art is so often about subtleties. I mean, for mm. me, I look harder. I really look hard. Yeah. Because, and also here we have drawings that, you know, could be Jasper Johns, no, they're Sturtevant. Or paintings mm. that could be Warhol, but no, they're Sturtevant. Mm. And it's, 
I mean, obviously, working here and being in this context, I'm kind of aligned. I'm awake to the possibilities. Mm. But coming into here, if you weren't, you go, oh, how great. Whoa. Mm. But it, so it's very, very interesting. Mm. And also, does it matter? Mm. Well, there's, a, there's maybe a, a kind of a stealing upwards of someone who, you know, in an unfortunate but obvious hierarchy is is above you on whatever mm. whatever pecking order and you know stealing mm. and bringing back down and so people start to look at this hierarchy slightly differently i think that can be really useful but i um stealing stealing from someone that's that suffered in a completely different way to the way you have i think that's you know i don't want to say stealing down but that's mm. but it's a I, context thing yeah it is i mm. it's a difficult it's a difficult question. I think I, I guess I deal so much with luxury in my art because of being in this neighborhood for so long and just through proximity, I feel, I always feel like I'm looking at things above me or, you know, in some kind of social class or, you know, financial class that I, um, that it, it feels more okay, but I, I'm, yeah, I'm never entirely sure. But like you say, there's an accountability. I think once, once you stop being a student, you, you sort of have to take responsibility for what it is you're making, you know, where being a student, you're expected to copy and, you know, maybe most things go in their trash and um, maybe something gets shown every now and then, but then this sudden kind of, you're but, able to be called out. For but then there's a kind of balancer that goes on because, you know, people see your shows, you have your peers who, who, who tell you and you talk to them and, and then critics review them. So there's always that kind of, you know, it's like a racing driver being going at a million miles an hour down the racetrack, always having to look in front of them, mm. because if they don't, the car goes off track. And I suppose there's always that sense of becoming restabilized, if I can put it like that. I imagine. Mm. I think I think stealing from stealing from like I think of Barbara Kruger and her stealing from advertising language as a way of saying, you know you've stolen from art originally and I'm going to steal it back yeah. as a way and sort of and sort of short circuit that advertising language. Mm. I'm going to say I'm going to make something that looks very like your language but I'm going to add I, mm. I'm going to add some because if you look, look at a Barbara Kruger there's no doubt that this isn't a straightforward ad, advertisement no. from the language and I think that's always I think that's always useful mm. to steal back from advertising which you know which is like they mm. say they take the cool parts of art mm. to begin with and to yeah. um and to then to use that language against them almost can be yeah. really I mean I certainly do that a lot in the mm. studio. Mm. And would there be anything I mean you, you talked about you know you wouldn't want to exploit someone else's suffering but what suffering aside would you feel comfortable at all quoting from say different cultures that you weren't part of that wasn't to do with suffering but it's just a language that you think it seems really interesting but you're not part of that culture all right so it's i mean true. in a way you you already do that with say flemish art of course yeah i mean I, and i you yeah. know any any woman i look yeah. at from before the 1950s yeah. is certainly not going to have had the experience i did yeah. in the art world you know yeah. this hilma af clinton Mm. that they showed at the Serpentine and then all over the world, you know, I'm mm. very aware she was the only woman at her art school. Mm -hmm. And to pretend to know what that would have been like mm. is is crazy, but I can still, there's still enough of it around mm. that I can take that and mm. and run with it, you know, mm. and look hard at every, you know, slight lack of inclusion I felt mm. and just sort of tug at that string. Mm. And I, I don't know, it could, can kind of be this collaboration across chronology in a mm. way. Mm. Where you've both, you've—I don't know. There's some, there's some agreement. Mm. I suppose I, I'm living and she's dead, so it's difficult to think of it as a mm. as a as a two-way well, agreement. She's probably but not I, dead, is she? No, maybe <laughs> not. Hilma. Yeah. No, that's true. If she did her work properly, she's, she's up the so. back here. Yeah. <laughs> but there's, yeah, I think I yeah. think a conversation can be had, but where you know, in the way that if you're having a conversation with someone, you you start to cut them off mm. and say, okay, but back to me. Yeah. Then I think the same etiquette applies. Yeah. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. No, that does. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Julia, as a curator, um, you know, because obviously art history is an ever-evolving discipline, and the way we understand art changes as we have greater understanding around the exclusions that happened around race or class or gender. Um, I mean, how does that affect the way you now curate shows, for example? 
I think consciousness is such an important thing, mm -hmm. and it's really perhaps one of the one of the words that I would use uh, um, about this discussion. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, stealing is being hyperconscious, really, mm -hmm. and so it's a responsibility, mm -hmm. um, and one that is culturally extremely important. Mm -hmm. And I think positive discrimination is very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, of course. I mean, I'm aware that whatever I do, I could always do it more or better. But mm -hmm. it's it's a very present mm -hmm. factor, mm -hmm. and one we discussed yeah. at considerable length in yeah. an ongoing way. Yeah. I mean, Alvaro, with you, do you want to keep curating? Do you think after after this show, would you like to keep putting shows together? Um, I mean, I don't. I don't really this. Even though I sort of curated this, I didn't really feel like I did. I mean, these are artists who I looked at and think about. And so it's not necessarily, um, whereas I think curating is about sort of maybe something um, more like scholarly in a way. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think this is works that I love, people that I love. And I said, I want to sort of, be respectful of them in a way to say, hey, I've learned so much from them. Here's what I've learned from them. So it's not, I mean, I'm always down to do that. Um, I'm always down to sort of share what I've learned and, and praise people who've helped me. So, um, but the you had talked about stealing in a sort of way. And it just, I keep thinking about this, these two incidents that I always sort of run through. One was I used to work at this uh, really bad retail job. And I, I worked with this older Armenian man who smoked weed all the time. And one day we were going to lunch and we're like in this very like sort of fancy neighborhood and he's like smoking weed. And I just thought, dude, what are you doing? And he just looked at me and he said, um, what, the, what did he say? He said, uh, he said like something like be cool you're going to get me caught and and um it was like i sort of think about that in terms of like i clearly look out of, you would never suspect that this like 70 year old armenian man was like smoking weed cuz he just looked like he was just you know walking down the mm -hmm. street and i think of stealing in that way you don't necessarily if I notice that you're doing something, if I notice that you're sort of doing something bad, if I notice like, oh, that's just a, a really bad version of a Henry Taylor painting, mm. then I sort of go, oh, you know, but if I don't know, if you get to be yourself, then I don't think that you've stolen anything. I just think that that's kind of who you are, yeah. you know? And, and so, um, I think with any of these artists, you sort of know that they're looking at other people, but they're organically and naturally in their own element that you never suspect that they're the per that they've stolen something from someone. Um, is was there an artist work that you would have loved to have in a show that you couldn't you couldn't get? Yeah, there was actually one. There's um, a Frida. I mean, there was a lot of works. I mean, but there's one in particular which is this amazing Frida Kahlo piece. Mm -hmm. that I sort of uh, printed and posted there. But it was right when she had, um, Frida I think is sort of, I always, and I've had this conversation with Julie, I think she's the most important painter of the last hundred years. Because if you ask 50 people in the street, name an artist, they'll name mm -hmm. Frida. Also, if I go to like 10 of my friends who are female, five of them will have a Frida some sort of freedom memorabilia. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea that, that she sort of, I always think art is about our humanity. Mm -hmm. And I think that for her to have touched so many people really thinks of, talks to how deep and inventive her work was. Mm -hmm. And so there's this painting out there that we were trying to get and it's basically right after she had lost a, um, a child because she had like, um, 
a, a sort of almost a spear go through her reproductive system so she can never have kids. And so it's a circle, of, it's a plate on a bed. And then the bottom of the bed is like, like clearly a bed sheet. It's a cactus fruit, which is this red sort of juicy fruit. And in the middle is a sort of green pear. And the pear is sort of coming off the, uh, of the rim of the plate. It's a green plate. And so right on, on the bottom of the sh sheet, you see the cactus fruit turns into like this sort of smear of red on the, on the sheet, which sort of hints at this sort of violent pain. And then right above is the, the, the bed sheet turns into the sky, which hints at the baby sort of going into the heavens. And it's such a brilliant painting mm -hmm. because it's such a, it's a painting about this woman who's lost, who's now bedridden, who's just lost a baby, but she's turned it not into the sort of really beautiful painting. And mm -hmm. I think as long as women are losing babies during childbirth or sometime before childbirth, Frida and that painting will always be really important. Yes. Okay. I mean, we tried to get it. It, it, um, it was in an Australian collection and then kind of disappeared. Or to put it another way, we couldn't find it. It's in my uh. bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll come to you <laughs> after it's said. <laughs> We're allowed to steal here, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, I, I just realised we've been talking for over an hour now, so um, maybe we can open it up to the audience. Uh, and if you've got a question, if you could wait for the microphone because it's being um, recorded. Thank you. Oh, just over here. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it was just related to what some of you were touching on and what uh, Tim Ingold refers to as correspondences. Uh, so um, uh, this idea that um, um, maybe us as artists need to correspond with other artists that may not be alive today and, and um, uh, working through our art processes is a way to continue that communication and that transmission mm -hmm. of, of learning and knowledge, um, which I think for me that's uh, really cultural. But uh, in this time and age of modernism, things are categorized and segmented into genres and sections and ownership and authorship and even the idea of individuality uh, versus collectivity um, is, is very pronounced uh, in a modern industrialized uh, form of art practice, um, which may have been different um, if, you, if you go back historically. So, uh, is there a question that emerged from that? Uh, um, <coughs> did you do you have an understanding of what I'm trying to? Um, I'm not quite sure what the question is. Um, we're calling it theft, but if you remove theft and and put correspondence oh, in its see. place, right. yeah, then yeah. it changes the whole yeah. Um, yeah. meaning of of yeah. of those actions. Yeah, it's a it's a more generous, inclusive word, isn't it? Yeah, it sort of takes away the aggression of the word theft. <laughs> Yeah, or it implies consent yeah. from the other. Yeah, side. because the very idea of theft yeah. is within a capitalist system of interpretation yeah. that something is owned by someone and therefore yeah. um, has to be stolen. Yeah, uh, to make it. Yeah, it's about uh, um, ownership. Yeah, exactly, and property and commodification. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Rather than learning uh, growth and uh, mm. communication. Mm. But I, th I guess what we're talking about is more is almost outside of capitalism in that mm. in that mood and emotion and mm. you know something like suffering. Things you I know can't that buy. Things you can't yeah, well, buy, so, although you know I'm sure yeah. they're trying. I yeah. just uh, yeah, I think this these thefts aren't of material goods. Often mm. we're not talking about art yeah. heists or walking into no. a gallery and literally stealing yeah. something. I think. Yeah. Are you asking about whether correspondence is possible? 
with somebody who's not alive anymore? Um, no, I, I think it's absolutely essential, especially um, as many artists are isolated. Um, it yeah. is one way that we can uh, continue with our practices over long periods of time, mm -hmm. as, as was mentioned earlier, to be an artist, um, it, to endure uh, many years of art practice. Yeah. There needs to be something drawing you on. And yeah, to feel less alone, I suppose. Yeah. And in that sense, we need the dead, you know. Mm. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, a question over here. Um, the gentleman here. Hey, thank you. Um, I was wondering about the post-it notes around, because um, uh, you guys didn't talk about that that much. Um, and they seem... <coughs> um, uh, they don't... They, they seem like a very sort of... Uh, uh, I don't know really how to say it, but the, an inauthentic sort of response to painting, um, this kind of trickle-down way of looking at the work. Um, and your conversation was very spectacular, um, you know, talking about suffering and, and art-making, whereas the response here in the note-making seems very uh, basic, you know, like line and um, perspective. Um, so I'm just wondering what that was about. Yeah, Alvaro. They're your <laughs> post-it notes, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so it was a bit of a way to try to organize the show because all of these, each of these are sort of divided into sections. And um, usually when I'm uh, in front of an artwork, I'm sort of just using whatever, like whether it's a post-it note or my sketchbook. I'm sort of just asking what it is. Um, and so it's sort of a balance in the notes between trying to sort of clearly mark that these are moments that are separating the sections. So, so this is a sort of uh, spatial logic or the south and, and um, without necessarily making the show about me, without it just being like, these are my interpretations of each and every one of these works is really about sort of giving each work the space for you to take away whatever you need to take away or whatever you could take away from the work and while at the same time I'm still semi-present in the exhibition. Yeah, it seemed, um, I was talking to a friend who's an artist and he, he saw a post-it note there and he said, I've got the exact same post-it note on my computer and it said something like, does this matter or something? Uh, and um, and I think the um, it was a, a I don't know it just felt like a tongue in cheek type of uh, way that we see as a critique to art as an audience sort of look how do we look at painting do we look at the way it's constructed or do we think about it in this sort of very um, you know uh, deep sort of uh, so, uh, sociological or contextual um, way so yeah just... I think I think the thing is that. If I do, don't mind. No, no, you know, please. Is that, you know, a response to a painting is never one thing. You know, it can be a, ban a, a banal observation that you make a connection with something in your own life, or it can be an extraordinary revelation about the iconography of, you know, the Renaissance use of shoes or something. You know, so I think the experience of a work of art and how you're influenced by a work of art is never simple. You know, it's a very complex conversation. And I, and I love the way, actually, that Alvaro has recognized that, that, you know, he's got grand narratives here, but he's also got small incidental observations that are equally valid. I think there's also something else that, um, in thinking about the show from the beginning, it's like giving the space over to an artist is, you know, um, it's a privilege, but it's also a, a, a responsibility. And the balance was to make sure that it didn't come out that Alvaro was being kind of sort of too, you know, here I am sort of um, in this situation. And that his thinking and his language, not only in the catalogue, but this direct conversation that he's having with the work should really be present as a way of reminding us really what we're looking at, which is one person's view of the world through the the images they've chosen in this exhibition and why they've chosen them. 
And it's really, it's a device, but it's also a proper one because when I say proper, it's not a manufactured one because this is very, very close to what Alvaro did when he showed his work in the Ely room, the first room as you come in on the left-hand side where Cooning mm. and Twombly and so on are. So it's... And it's also about not creating sort of crude headlines that say this section is the line, for example. But it's a rather more it's a rather more modest, but as helpful and real way of doing it. Mm. So it was thought through with quite some care. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question? Ah, Norman. Yeah. Well, I'll ask about familiarity as well, and what you know, what you chance on in life. You know what I mean? And you may chance on something tomorrow, which is fantastic. But are, are, well, I suppose the question I'd like to ask you: Are there things, at least in your head, that you've come across that you don't like, that have not really, that you would not kind, that have not kind of impacted on your head, or have not informed you, or does everything inform you? Everything informs me. I think the things that I don't like. Sort of, um, when I was in BA, the painter Carol Dunham uh, g gave was probably one of the best advice I had was said, um, you need to go and find out why you hate, it, hate that painting. And so I would go and I would make like bad versions of painters that I hated. Um, and somewhere through it, I mean, I, uh, there's a lot of artists where I go, oh, I mean, I, I mean, I necessarily love what he did, but I, I understand why they did it. And then it makes me go, well, I wonder if I could turn it into something that I like, or does it make sense in this painting? And the paintings are never really, to be honest, like, uh, I know this is sort of cliche, but I'm really just listening to the painting. And sometimes the painting may need a decision that I actually don't like, but it makes sense in the work. In fact, I'm usually very afraid when I love a decision, because then I go, now I'm just telling the painting what to do. And it actually may not be the case. I mean, really me, me needing to do something that I hate to do, mm -hmm. then it needs to, it needs to happen. Does hate turn to love? Um, Sometimes? It goes, it, it, you know, it, it doesn't turn to love, but it, it comes to, oh, I get it. I get, I get why you I did that. Cool. Yeah. But I think Izzy might. Oh, I thought you were going to say something out there. No, I was just I was thinking about, a, we, we've spoken just when we were walking in East London about how discomfort can often come before a really big, important change. And that's, I mean, that's a very studio-specific thing. But, um, yeah, doing something that's for the work and not my own ego and then kind of being able to separate those two. Yeah. Which is hard enough, I think, every, every time. But... Um, yeah, what I'm saying is I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The initial discomfort can often be a long term. Yeah. And knowing that we're going to be doing this for 70, 80 years, I think <laughs> a little discomfort doesn't really matter so much yeah. in, the, in the long term. But also, I think it's like, you know, we're making art and artists to be seen by a public. And I think the worst thing I could do is listen to a song from a musician that I love. And I could tell maybe, you know, I think the musicians, the great musicians, are sort of being responsive to what's happening within the sort of, within all of the things in the studio, within the instrument, within, and maybe they're having a bad day, but I don't want to randomly hear them scream on a, on, a, on a very beautiful song. You know, maybe the song needs, they're sort of following through with what the song needs, and I think that's what we're doing in the studio. We're following through with what the, well, what the painting needs. And so it really isn't about me. I don't think, I, at least I'm sort of a vehicle for it. I'm sort of following it, but it's not, I'm following it based on the experiences that I have. But I, I, I find it really draining when I look at a piece of art or when I, and I could tell that it's all ego, that the artist just essentially just sort of did whatever they wanted to do on the canvas and that they had no sort of emotional concern for can that red match with that sort of darker red? They just did whatever the, whatever they wanted. But having said that, I've I found whenever I've tried to describe an artwork to someone that I really love, it sounds terrible. 
And then when I describe something I despise, it sounds really good. Yeah. Like then just in that kind of verbal, and you realize that the, the passion involved or the kind of amount of brain space it's taking up is exactly the same. Mm. And that there's, I think maybe there has to be both. Mm. To feel hate for something is actually quite, yeah. I'd, I'd, you know, I think anyone would prefer hate to indifference, I guess. Mm. Mm. Um, any other questions? Oh yeah, up the back there. Um, thank you. Do you think that um, sort of progression is sort of mutually exclusive to um, sort of stealing ideas from other artists? Like if that sort of cycle stops, do you think that sort of creating art would end or would artists like eventually evolve on their own without having to sort of take inspiration from other artists? Is it sort of possible for them to exist sort of singularly? Do you mean, is it, ex is it possible to exist making art in a vacuum without yes, quoting that's anyone? Right. Yeah. I would think it was impossible. What did no, you guys I, don't. So. I think that's impossible because we're not, you know, I think that's the biggest misconception because so, that's so, so really ego driven. You know, we're, pe we're, we're people who are sort of a product of all of the people around us. We're influenced by all of the people around us. And I think, you know, the idea of like um, creating something completely that has never existed is is the most ego driven thing that's just mm -hmm. not real you know you can't you could make combinations of things and become really inventive in the combination of the thing but also like what sense does it make if i just start saying random bullshit words that none of you understand mm -hmm. You know, you'd be like, oh, what the fuck is this guy talking about? You know, so it's like, I think we, you know, in art, we really are about, we're about what's happening to us, but we're re but because it's happening to us, it's also happening to you guys. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and it also helps us feel more connected and be, and feel more real. It's like people making art helps us understand that you're not alone that you're not crazy, that this thing that you feel, this thing that you saw, somebody else saw it too. And so I don't think it's ever, you could ever, ever make art without the relationship of the world that you live in. And that's a good thing, right? And that's the most important thing because yeah. that's all we have is time and this relationships that we have because that's all that, you know, we don't know what's going to happen the next mm. thing. The only thing that we have is time. Yeah. Is he? Would you agree? Yeah. I, I, I don't even know. I'm trying to work out what medium that artwork would be in. Right. If it was yeah. made in a vacuum, like, yeah. what would it? Yeah, it's true. What would it be? I'm not sure. It's quite intriguing to think about it. I think it yeah. might be a really bad artwork. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need something to push up against, I yeah. think. And that was, again, sort of talking about hate and love. You need mm. the... Um, to know, yeah. uh, to see something and make yeah. decisions from that. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and any more questions at all? Okay, might wind up there, yeah. Well, look, thank you very much to Des Ropek and to Julia, Alvaro and Izzy. Thank <laughs> you.